Good evening, everybody. Welcome in as we present this week's edition of the Milford Informer. I am your host, Tim Coet. Before we get to our top stories of the week, we have a few local news items we'd like to share. First, an update from the Milford Water Company. While we've seen an increase in rainfall over the last few weeks compared to the exceptionally dry summer months, the Milford Water Company is maintaining the current ban on all outdoor watering. The latest measurements taken at the Echo Lake Reservoir showed the water level at just 37.1 percent full, the lowest recorded level in more than 20 years, according to Water Company manager David Condry. The Water Company reported rainfall totals for the month of September at just 1.39 inches, and the total rainfall for 2016 is nearly five inches below the total for this time last year. The Water Company is hopeful that as the water usage drops in the town over the fall and winter months, it will help stabilize the levels moving forward. So while the community hopes to finally see an end to this elongated drought, it looks like we won't be seeing any rainfall as a result of Hurricane Matthew. Earlier in the week, meteorologists were bracing residents for the chance that Matthew could pass close to New England. All signs now point to the storm mainly staying out to sea well south of New England. Certainly good news for Game 3 of the ALDS scheduled for Sunday afternoon at Fenway Park. Now let's get to this week's top stories rundown. Tonight, hear from Milford TV member R.J. Sheedy as he gives us an update on the wild presidential election and he lets us know what to expect when talk show goes live this weekend. Also tonight, we'll give you a chance to get to know new boys soccer head coach Brian Edwards and we'll find out his expectations for the Scarlet Hawks as they head into the second half of their season. And later in sports, we have highlights from a dramatic back and forth volleyball matchup between Milford and Oliver Ames. There is no one who provides a more unique take on this wild presidential election season than Milford TV member RJ Sheedy. With election day now less than a month away, I welcomed RJ in studio to once again get his political perspective and to also find out the details on RJ's very special live show coming up this weekend. Once again, we are very happy to be joined on the Milford Informer by our Milford TV member, RJ Sheedy, host, of course, of Talk Show with RJ Sheedy, which you've got another big live show coming up this weekend, a very yeah. special themed live show. We want to get to all of the details on that over the course of the interview. But RJ, one of the reasons we had you on the uh -huh. show a couple of weeks ago was to just get your thoughts on the on the election season at that point. We were still in the relatively early stages of the general election. Now we're getting down to crunch time. We've got less than a month to go. And I feel like what better voice to hear getting close to election than time me? than RJ Sheedy. Just you, <laughs> you've become one of our trusted political correspondents. So we wanted to Well that's to, setting a bar really low Tim. We <laughs> wanted to wow. bring you back on the show to, to, to get some thoughts. We've had a, we've had a lot of craziness of course uh -huh. go on in the last few weeks. We're we're full speed into into debate season now. We've already seen the presidential candidates debate. We've seen the vice presidential candidates debate. But I, I want to start with uh, some news from the Libertarian Party. You had an opportunity to speak to uh, one of your guests on your previous live show uh, that had close ties to the Libertarian Party. Uh, but some rocky days for, for Gary Johnson yeah. over the last month or so. What, what is going on with the, with the Gary know, Johnson campaign? You know, it's not looking good. A few weeks ago, a reporter on Morning Joe on, on MSNBC asked him about um, what would you do about Aleppo, which is a town in Syria that's under, I don't know what's going on there. I don't even know what it is. I'm not running for president. I don't which even know Which is about the key. That. It, it, that's it, the key. Yes. It, he's running for president, and like this is supposed to be like a serious issue, and he doesn't know about it. That's kind of bad. That looks really bad. And then he fumbled again with Chris Matthews when he asked him, um, who's your favorite foreign le leader? He couldn't come up with one name. This guy's <laughs> running for president, and he couldn't just come up with one name of a foreign leader. Like, that's not good. Um, he also failed to make the 15% get into the debates, and basically his presence on that debate stage would have made or break his ticket, and because he didn't make it, it really broke it. So do you feel at this point that the, the momentum that was building with the Johnson campaign has, has dissipated a bit? Do you yeah. think he's still going to have uh, a strong presence on Election Day? I think he's going to do really well in states that he's already pulling high in the states like Utah and his home state of New Mexico. I think he's going to do good there. Um, I don't see him winning any electoral votes. 
it just won't happen. <laughs> so as we, as we kind of shift our attention now towards the, the two main candidates, we saw them debate for the first time mm -hmm. a little over a week ago. We'll see a second presidential debate coming up this weekend. Well, I'm sure you had an opportunity to watch yeah, that debate. I, what, uh -huh. what were your big takeaways? Um, first off, Hillary Clinton did the job that she was supposed to do. She was, her only job was to go in there and focus on policy and let Trump be Trump, which is exactly what happened. Um, she stayed on message, she did a little shimmy, chosen character. <laughs> and one thing that really impressed me about her debate performance was at one point Donald Trump um, accused her of, of coming prepared for the debate. And she looked at Donald Trump and she said, you're right, I did come prepared for this debate and I'm preparing to be president. And she just said that with such confidence where like, I've never been Hillary Clinton supporter, but that moment when she did that really made me say, I got to vote for this woman. Like, like she knows what she's doing. Um, the vice presidential debate, that was on Tuesday this week. And what really surprised me about that was Mike Pence's performance. I don't really know much about Mike Pence. Um, being a choice of Donald Trump, I was expecting him to be a loose cannon. But a lot of the experts are saying that he won that debate, which is really surprising. And he really, I think, outshadowed Trump. And when, I, when the debate ended, I said, wow, that was his audition for 2020. Five minutes later, I think it was Tom Brokaw on NBC News who said the same thing. I'm like, I just said that. I beat you to it. So this, is, this is why we yeah. have you on. You have the inside <laughs> scoop. But I, I think you bring up an interesting point, and it seems like temperament is a word that gets thrown around uh -huh. on these political talk shows all the time. And it, it almost seems at this point as that's what the, that's what the political experts, that's what the, the voting public is, is really looking at right now is sort of that persona that you give off during these debates. And, and that is what seemed to clearly go in Hillary Clinton's favor in the first presidential debate. But looking at that vice presidential debate, I think the big takeaway was while the substance of what Tim Kaine had to say was on point and effective, the way he necessarily showed himself during the debate, a lot of uh, being very argumentative, yeah. interrupting almost as much, if not more, than what we saw Donald Trump do during the presidential debate. Do you think in the long run that sort of thing could hurt Hillary Clinton in the, with the voting public? You know, I think a lot of Americans, when Hillary Clinton announced that Tim Kaine was going to be the vice president, I don't think a lot of Americans was like, wow, yeah, Tim Kaine. A lot of people respect, were expecting her to make a, pro a progressive choice like um, Elizabeth Warren or maybe having Bernie Sanders or Joe Biden or somebody like more like high profiled and more um, um, progressive to be on her ticket. Um, I really don't think the vice president is going to make or break this election. Uh, Mike Pence's performance on Tuesday night is not going to make people say I'm going to vote for Donald Trump. Tim Kaine's performance isn't going to make people say I'm going to vote for Clinton. So now as we look forward, we have two more presidential debates mm -hmm. to look forward to. The one this weekend should be interesting, a town hall style debate. Thinking about these next two debates, is there something in your opinion that Donald Trump can do to kind of change the dynamic right now? It feels as though the Clinton campaign has all of the momentum right now, all of the polls nationwide in the key swing states going in her favor. Is there something that Donald Trump can do to kind of make a late surge? He can come out being um, more patient. He can come out not interrupting. He can come out being more respectful. Um, I think one advantage that Donald Trump does have is that in the third debate, Fox News' is Chris Wallace is going to be moderating it. And that, to me, kind of like sends a sign that it's going to be more like softball questions for him and more gotcha questions for Clinton. Because one thing about these debates is that the commission the candidates, they don't see the questions. The only people that know what questions are going to be asked is the moderator himself. So I think if Donald Trump wants to have any glimmer of light, it's in that third debate with um, Chris Wallace. It's been the wildest presidential campaign probably of all time. Hopefully it will never get any crazier than this, but one way or another it will finally all be over in just about a month from now. And and we'll see where things are from then. We might have to have you on one more time to give your final thoughts. But we do want to get your thoughts on your upcoming live show this weekend, oh. a big event. It's always such a big event here at the studio. So uh -huh. tell us about what, what makes this particular live show special. You alluded to it on, on the last time we had yeah, you on. Yeah, we talked about it, about it a little bit back in August. But on October 8th, here on Milford TV, we're live at 8 o'clock. We will be celebrating my 21st birthday. Major here milestone. Here on air. Major milestone. This is the last big birthday before they're just disappointing after this. <laughs> um, so we're going to be celebrating turning 21. We have Maureen Farby of Craft Roots Brewery coming in. She's going to be bringing in some, um, some wonderful Craft Roots beer. She's bringing in um, the Blondie in IPA and the Pumpkin Ale for us to try on air. Um, we also have music from the very talented Justin Ray. 
and we have a few former guests of talk show coming here to ask me an embarrassing question on air after I've had a few drinks. So literally anything can happen. I literally told them, don't tell me these questions. So all I know is that they're going to be funny. Some of them could be embarrassing, personal. You're just going to have to tune in to see what happens. It, it sounds exciting now. Is, is Saturday your actual birthday? No, my birthday was actually on um, September 25th. So you're, um, you're technically already? I'm already 21, yes. I've already been to well, my... Well, congratulations. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Well, it should, it should be exciting. Uh, a lot of great guests lined up. And, and as always, you welcome in the live studio audience. So Absolutely, yeah. out, out there in the public, you can let people know the details for when they can come down if they want to be part of the audience. Totally, yeah. If you're watching at home and uh, you want to come out and see a show live for yourself, uh, show up at, here at Milford TV. Um, anytime between 7.30, 7.45, get to come here, pick out a seat in our lovely studio. Um, before the show, I get to come out and like talk to you guys and welcome you guys to the show. And after that, we are live at 8. And you're just in for an absolute fun time, a great show. It really should be a great time. Now, are you looking ahead to future live shows to, to wrap yeah. up the year? Do you have other things in motion for, for future shows yet, or is it still a work in progress? One thing that we have, um, we're have, we working on right now is that there's a wonderful musician in the Worcester area by the name of Dale LePage. Um, he's a wonderful musician. He styles in like swing-type music. Um, he also hosts this program in Worcester called Pride TV, New England Pride TV, and it's being aired all throughout the country. And so next Friday, I have the opportunity to go see him at a um, live CD taping he's doing out in Sturbridge. And afterwards, we'll be interviewing him about music and um, New England Pride TV and all things Dale LePage. So you got that to hopefully be looking for on November 12th on our next live show. Oh, that's great. That's that's really exciting. And and at a time like this, we've got our, our annual membership meeting coming up later this month. We'll have the details later on in the informer. But uh, just a, a, a great time to 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 let the community know this. The amount of work that you put into doing talk show with RJ Sheedy, it, it never stops. You're always booking guests. You're always planning ahead for the show. And your your show is entirely run by people your age, by yeah. by other members, by other volunteers. So just kind of talk a little bit about just the 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 amount of effort and time it takes to, to put on your, your show each and every time? You know, the process of creating, to, of creating Saturday Night's Live show, it all started back in August. Uh, we booked the studio time for the show. We started contacting guests then. Um, we're basically writing the show up until the day of the show itself. Um, and one thing that I really, really love about my, about my show is, like you said, kids my age help me run the show. My brother Matthew, who's 17, is the director. Um, Malcolm Zale is 15 years old, and he's like pretty much um, second in command on my show. Um, and it's so great being able to come here once a month with a crew of my friends and people my own age and putting on a show like this. People are so surprised, my guests, when they come in, and they just see like kids running the show. That really surprised them, and like it, it, it's really great that I get to use my show as not only a experience for me to get myself out there, but as an experience for my crew to learn how to do something like this. It's just it's a great reminder for the community to know that if if you're out there watching and you've ever had that kind of interest to come in and and learn the ropes for for putting together a television program, maybe you have some content that you're thinking of that you'd like to have out on air. Take this as an example, R.J. Sheedy, uh, a couple of years ago, yeah. you, you came in here for the first time learning the ropes yourself, and yeah, now, it was and now it's, it's become a, 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 a finely tuned machine every time you come in here. Oh, that's so kind of you to say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so great for everybody to know, and, and again, we'll give you the details on our membership meeting, but great to keep in mind at a time like this. If you're out there, if you're not a member, uh, it's, it's very easy to sign up and become a member or become a volunteer here at Milford TV. So with that, RJ, we, we thank you so much for coming in. Great stuff as always on the political front. We look forward to your live show coming up this weekend, and we look forward to talking to you again in the future. Absolutely. I love being here, Tim. Thank you so much for welcoming me. There is no question that RJ is one of the hardest working members we have here at Milford TV. And staying on that topic, we want to let all of our members, volunteers, and the rest of the Milford community know that later this month we will be hosting our annual Milford TV membership meeting. The meeting is set to take place here at our Milford TV studios on Tuesday, October 25th at 7 p.m. Milford TV staff as well as our board of directors will be on hand to discuss the latest goings-on here at the studio. 
It is a great opportunity for our membership and volunteer base to come together to meet and network and also give their ideas and input regarding studio operations. We will also offer full studio tours and refreshments will be available. This year we also encourage members to provide a two-minute highlight video showcasing the content they produce here at Milford TV. And even if you are not currently a Milford TV member, if you've ever thought about creating your own television show, or you're just curious about what goes on here at the studio, we encourage you to attend the meeting. Again, our third annual Milford TV membership meeting will take place on Tuesday, October 25th, beginning at 7 p.m. On to our next top story now. There is no question that Milford is a very passionate community when it comes to soccer. For Milford High School, the boys' soccer team the last few years has been a challenge, to say the least, as the team collected just nine total wins in the 2014 and 2015 seasons combined. This season, the team welcomed in a new head coach in Brian Edwards, and we were fortunate enough to spend some time with Coach Edwards earlier this week to talk about his first season at the helm of the program. A lot of effort with little time left on the clock for Milford to mount to come back and there will be no more time there is the final whistle so another frustrating day for the Scarlet Hawks team it's been a tough couple of years for boys soccer in Milford after failing to qualify for playoffs in the previous two seasons the athletic department turned to Brian Edwards to take over the varsity head coaching position in hopes he could steer the program in a more positive direction it was kind of it was kind of surprising. I mean, I, I went for the job. I didn't, on all, in all honesty, I didn't really expect to get it. But I figured I wanted to go for it, and um, uh, you know, I, I had a feeling going into it that I had a shot. But I was surprised. I was pleasantly surprised. So when it happened, I was kind of like, oh, <laughs> all right, <laughs> cool. Um, and it's it's been a lot of fun. And it's just, I mean, it's not it's the same as coaching JV or middle school. It's just the kids are stronger and faster, but it's the same game. Um, so it's just as fun. It's kind of cool being able to like coordinate the different teams together and try to get your vision for the whole program moving forward, uh, which is very nice, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. As Coach Edwards has moved forward through this inaugural season, he has had a wealth of experience to draw on when it comes to coaching soccer within the greater Milford community. So I started as an assistant with varsity, and then I, I worked as a volunteer coach in Milford Hope to Youth Soccer uh, with the like eighth grade, seventh grade age group, and that was probably my that was a really fun time. That that group actually just graduated. That was a senior class just graduated, but when they were in seventh and eighth grade, and then uh, I came back as an assistant again, and I moved forward as a JV position, running the JV team for a few years, which was really fun. And then I coached the middle school team last year for girls, which was my first time coaching girls, so that was cool. And um, and now at the varsity, so it's been, you know, different levels. Uh, and I also got to help coach the girls varsity as an assistant last year, which was really fun working with Jay, and I learned a lot. So um, it was yeah, it's been a it's been a lot of fun. It, it, you want to play, but coaching is, is, is just, is, I guess, the second best thing. So, you know, it's, it's a good time. It's, it's nice being able to work with guys and, and see their skills improve and, and just see the, you know, when you see a team come together and the guys are just, you know, they really want to play with each other and they want to work together. And that's the best part of coaching. It's like the wins and losses and all that stuff. It's whatever. It's really the, the relationships you develop with the players and, and, you know, and seeing them grow as not only players but as people too. It's, that's, the, that's why I do it. Though he wasn't with the varsity program the previous two seasons, Coach Edwards was able to keep close tabs on what was happening with a team that was made up of a good deal of players he coached in the lower levels. I'm not going to lie, I wasn't happy, uh, but not, not, so much, not so much with the record. Just, I just didn't like the way it was going. I didn't like, I didn't like what I was seeing you know, um, from the players' perspective, and I, just, I thought that you know, when you play soccer, you should have fun. You, know, you should enjoy what you're doing. And, um, to me, that's the most important thing. You want it to be, you know, for me, when I played high school soccer, that was my best time I ever had. Honestly, it was probably the best experience I ever had. And I wanted that to happen with other guys. So you know, that was what, that's kind of what motivated me to go for the position. I said, you know what, I'll do everything I can to make that a reality. And, you know, we're, we're not perfect right now, but we're, we're, we're doing the best we can. And the guys are working hard. And, you know, I, I think we're coming along. We're showing progress. So we're not where we want to be yet, but we're, we're getting there. And we're, we're starting to get some results that we feel like we can be proud of. Proud of. The players on the team agree that the change in culture brought about by Coach Edwards has had an immediate positive impact. It's like a whole different coaching style, basically. Before we like played the uh, the original like Hawkmock soccer, and now I think we got like a, a whole new a whole new look to it, especially for the people who don't play club. I think Coach Edwards really brings in like a like a club aspect to it, and really brings in like 
the fundamentals and basics of soccer that we were missing before. As for the play on the field, Coach Edwards was quick to come up with what he felt were the core strengths of this year's team. Technical ability. Um, we have some really, really talented players on the ball. We've got some guys that really can, can do things with the ball. I mean, you saw some of the guys we have. It's, it's really it's, it's fun to watch. So, you know, we really put a stress on, on moving the ball on the ground, short, sharp passes, you know, quickness and agility. We're not a big bruising team. So some of these Hawkmock teams, they, can, they try to bully us off the ball, which kind of happened to a little bit yesterday against OA. But when we are able to get to the ball first and move the ball quickly and use our skill on the ball, it, it can be really difficult for these teams to deal with. And when it's happening in games, it's, it's, that's what we want. And that's what, I, as, a, as a coach, that's the, the style of soccer I want to see. I don't want to see just like, you know, kick the ball to the defender, bomb the ball over the top and hope for the best. I'm trying to, what I want to see is these guys develop skills that hopefully can bring them to the collegiate level. And, and bring them success there. So, and we have the guys that can do it. And the other main strength is just the belief. These guys have a really strong character. They, they didn't, they don't give up. I mean, we were one and four after that that Canton game. That Canton loss was really tough because we played so well, but we didn't get the result. You know, I've seen a lot of teams just kind of quit when they go one and four and they lose a game like that. They just start looking for excuses. They start blaming people, and they didn't. These guys just have a tremendous character, and I think that's that's probably our biggest strength. The, the character is the main thing. Then the technical ability is a close second. I feel like we've. Uh, done pretty well uh, based off of last year because we've definitely improved as a team. I think we're a lot closer as a team and that just helps us with our play. With the team now entering the later stages of the season, I asked Coach Edwards what the key will be moving forward for the Hawks to work their way back into a playoff spot. I've tried to model it for these guys. Like, Don't think about, don't think about anything else but what's, what's in front of us. Um, so that's what we're focused on. You know? And I think if we do that, I think Good things will happen. Now that we're hitting the stretch of the season where we're right, we're one game under 500. If we can basically fight and scrap and claw our way through this part of the schedule, we can look at the reality of making the playoffs for the first time in three years. So it's, it's an exciting time to be playing right now and coaching. Last week, the Scarlet Hawks football team faced their first road test of the season as they squared off in North Attleboro against their newest division rival. The game was originally scheduled for last Friday night. However, rainy conditions combined with North Attleboro's natural grass field forced the game to be postponed to Sunday afternoon. Once the game finally got underway, it was Milford who was able to seize momentum in the first quarter as quarterback Matt Curran finished off a lengthy drive with a one-yard rush to the end zone to give the Hawks an early lead. It turned out to be a short-lived lead as Rocketeers quarterback Chad Peterson hooked up with Bobby Mylod on a 30-yard touchdown pass to tie the game. Peterson and Mylod would connect on another TD pass in the second quarter, and North would head into halftime up 14-7. Unfortunately, things would get worse for Milford in the second half as a lost fumble in the end zone and a big 73-yard TD rush from North's Nick Rajati would give the Rocketeers a lead they would not relinquish. Milford would go on to lose to North Attleboro by a final score of 35-7. to The loss broke a two-game winning streak for the Scarlet Hawks, who now sit at 2-2, two two, tied for second place in the Davenport Division standings. The Hawks are on the road again this week, matching up with the 2-2 two two Foxborough Warriors. Meanwhile, we had an opportunity to cover the volleyball team this week, as they were in action Wednesday night against Oliver Ames. The game represented the halfway point in the regular season for the girls, who entered the game with an impressive 7-2 record. Let's check out the full highlights of Milford versus Oliver Ames. Your Lady Scarlet Hawks getting set to take on the Kelly Rex Division Oliver Ames Lady Tigers. No longer a Davenport Division matchup, but a Hockamock League crossover match as Milford and Oliver Ames get set to clap. Falling behind here early, a 6-2 margin. Still early on in the set as Sabrina Harstick gets some time out on the floor, comes up empty on that attack. And an early 7-2 lead, so you're seeing it here. Oliver Ames, who's fresh off a hard-fought game just about 24 hours ago, looking to be a little bit more in sync. Tagami meets that one on the back line. Set up on the left side for Brianna Croto, and Milford gets the point. 
points now for Milford. The serve continues for Alves. She just can't sneak that one over the net, and that is it for this opening set. Good back and forth action, but eventually Zagami able to get the kill. And Milford pumped up as they open up a 7-2 lead. Now Frodo pops it over the front line and that gives Milford a second set win. Nice block in front. That looked like Katie Flynn who had the block that time for Oliver Ames, but Milford keeps it alive. Now Flynn from that right side. Set up for Zagami. Zagami gets it over the front line, but it's dug out by Homer. Now Zarangian, but too long. And a nice back and forth that time, but it leads to the 17th point for the Tigers. There's Rachel Foley. And that one sneaks in for Juliana Tracy right to that back corner. Milford pulling out in front by a margin of 18-13. Again, trying to force a fifth and deciding set, passing the two-hour mark now. Got underway just after 5.30 in the evening. Now right around 7.40 in the evening as we start this fifth and final set. Milford able to get that all-important first point. Soft shot up front by Kayla Raymond. Lobeser now for Zagami. Sends it right to Sadie Homer. She could not dig it out. And it's now an 11 to 8 lead for Milford. And a match point coming up for the Milford Lady Scarlet Hawks at 14 to 11. And here is Lauren Zarangian. Can she finish it for the home team? Instead, she delivers it long out on the near sideline. A win right within Milford's grasp, but now it is Oliver Ames with a chance to seal it here. McCarthy serve, and that is how it ends. A double hit up front from Milford, and shockingly, Oliver Ames is able to come back and win this final set 16-14. And what a heartbreaking loss for Milford. Again, just so close. Next week, we are excited to be checking in with our good friends over at the Bay Path Humane Society to get the details on a big fundraiser they have coming up and to also meet some of their furry friends anxiously awaiting to find their permanent home. We also hope to check in with the Crossroads Clubhouse as well as the Milford Area Chamber of Commerce. We hope you will join us again next Friday night. Until then, from all of us here at Milford TV, this is Tim Coet saying have a great week. So long, everybody.